afternoon to everyone. I, I guess it's mostly noon in your places right now. Um, so today we have Dr. Shadi who will be leading the webinar. Um, so Dr. Shadi is frequently sought after for giving in-person and virtual talks on the current state of veterinary medicine. So we're very honored to have him today. So, <laughs> um, so can you tell us more about yourself, sure. Shadi? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so my name is Dr. Shadi Arafidj. I'm a board certified small animal surgeon. I graduated from Cornell University in 2006. That was then followed by a one year general internship at Angel Animal Medical Center in Boston. After that, I did two one-year surgical internships at Long Island Veterinary Specialist in New York, followed by my three-year uh, surgery residency at LIVS, Long Island Veterinary Specialist. After that, I moved out west, joined a specialty hospital here in Las Vegas. After that, did some locum work across the country. Um, from there, in 2017, I moved to Silicon Valley, managed three hospitals there, uh, on call 24-7 as the surgeon for all three facilities. After about a year of that, I was on call 24 seven at the hospital in Los Angeles where I was part owner. We converted that hospital from an overnight facility to a 24 seven ER multi-specialty and I was in charge of the specialty departments. And then after that, the end of 2019, I finally launched Vet Triage and I've been doing that ever since. Amazing, thank you so much for joining us, Shadi. Um, well, you can go ahead and start whenever you want. Great. Give me one sec. I'll see. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. Perfect. All right. One sec. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So thank you for for having me. To uh, on possibilities, a phenomenal organization. And we're going to talk about communication and client relationships. So we already went through my background. For those who do not uh, know of me or have never heard of me before, there I am. We're going to go over some definitions regarding communication skills. We're going to talk about the team members involved with the whole communication circuit of veterinary medicine. We'll talk about how, how communication affects our world then the challenges that we are facing in the vet field with regard to communication, and then most importantly, probably some solutions, some methods that you can use starting today with your own practice, with your own clientele, and then finally any questions or comments you guys have. I do have proceedings available that can be uh, uh, divvied out whenever, and those proceedings are way more comprehensive than this talk will be. This talk is more intended to be um, very practical for everybody and kind of enjoy the ride, but those, those proceedings are going to be very uh, useful for you for referencing. So we're very familiar at, with the gold standard care of veterinary medicine and what that implies or what it was supposed to imply was a standard that is at the bleeding edge of technology, procedures, innovative med medical therapies, and that's what we considered gold standard. However, over time, it's morphed into medical monotheism, where gold standard became the only standard of care. And we're gonna talk about spectrum of care later because this mutation of gold standard care is really doing a lot of harm in the profession, but that's what gold standard care was supposed to mean, and now it seems to be the only standard. When you look at different types of care, I already mentioned spectrum of care, there are three main ones in the literature. One is spe pet specific care. That implies the relationship between the client, the pet, what options they have, and trying to make the best decision possible for that dynamic. Continuum of care is synonymous with spectrum of care, where a variety of options exist and all options are viable dependent on the situation, but all options are viable. They're all fair options. And deliberation is the process by which clients, pet owners will go through those options and talk about them out loud, think about them with the veterinarian, with their family, with their friends. Finally, contextualized care is 
care being offered within a context. So taking into account things like someone's culture, um, uh, ethnicity, their geographic location, their financial situation, whatever it may be, but the care is contextualized to that person's situation. And these are by no means specific boundaries. These are simply just ways to think about the different types of relationships you can have with your clients. Then there's the client veterinarian interaction that all of us as doctors are familiar with that involves the client in an exam room with the doctor and the pet. You're going over the history, performing a physical exam, recommending diagnostics, going over results, having a plan of set forth, and that, that functionality where you're very used to. Finally, work culture, which is the embodiment of everything under in, in brick and mortar um, involving the leadership, the, the support team, everything that supports what the team needs, all the trials and tribulations of that is work culture. When you look specifically at communication, most of us are familiar with this. It's made up of verbal and nonverbal types of communication. And the vast majority of folks believe that not only is nonverbal more prominent than verbal when you're talking to somebody, but it actually may be even more influential than what you're actually saying. Nonverbal inv involves that list there, facial expressions, tone of voice, movement, appearance, eye contact, gestures, posture, but basically anything that doesn't involve using your words is considered nonverbal, whereas verbal, of course, is using actual words. But com communication, de defining communication is also difficult because it's such a complex term. So you can also look at it in terms of what does it involve? Well, you've got the words that you're using. You've got the method by which you are going to share those words. You're going to have the perception of the person speaking, listening, and the back and forth. And of course, communication is situation dependent. There are some forms of communication that will require way more verbal. There are others that it will be more nonverbal. And, and that interaction there varies depending on the situation. So I like this, this, this picture here because it kind of gives you sort of the stages of talking to somebody. First, you're paying attention, actively paying attention, actively listening to what they're saying, and you're withholding judgment during that process. You're thinking, okay, I'm going to have a judgment call here, but while I'm, while I'm hearing this person out, let me actually hear them out, let me pay attention. Then you reflect on what they say, you think about it. How does that jive with your own experiences, your own life? And then you ask for clarity. Okay, so did you mean this or that when you said that? Or what did you mean by this? Or can you expand on, on that concept there? And then finally, you can summarize. Okay, if I'm understanding you correctly, this is what you're thinking, this is what you're saying. And then after that, sharing or implementing or concluding the conversation, whatever it may be, but that's a general process. We do this every day, and this is not a, uh, this is not a process necessarily that takes days, weeks, months, years. This is happening moment by moment within seconds or minutes in a live conversation. But it's nice to break it down. So you can further break down nonverbal communication into these four categories. Kinesics is the embodiment of facial expressions, tension, touch, movement. So your physical body. Prox proxemics is the spacing between everybody, patient, client, and veterinarian. Paralanguage are the parts of your, of your speech that are not words related, pitch, tone, volume. And then autonomic system. Your, your cheeks getting red, are you feeling sweaty, do your, your palms feel kind of clammy, those types of, of, of uh, um, changes to the body that are not related to conscious effort, so from the autonomic nervous system, also affects nonverbal communication. This chart is simply here to talk about uh, two different uh, uh, categories. One is if you look at the systems category there, staffing issues, work process issues, organizational culture. The reason why I bring this up is because it's very important when you're in an exam room and you're trying to give that pet owner your all, trying to give them all the information, educate them, have them make decisions, you have to leave all the other stuff behind. You can't let these things linger in the exam room with, with you because it's going to affect your tempo, your, your, your tone, your uh, body movement, how long you're spending in that room. Does the client feel that you're in a rush or you're panicked or you've got other stressors that are not related to that interaction? So keep that in mind when you're in an exam room. Try to leave all that stuff behind. Be 100% present in that room with that client. And the second point here is perspectives. Everybody's got their own perspectives. And you may think one way as a veterinarian for a specific case that you're dealing with, 
that client may ask you a question or come to a conclusion that you may never have heard of or thought of. And it might actually be a viable conclusion. And not only that, you may be able to use it for future cases. So keep in mind the perspective of things. You're going in there with a plan, but you have to be open-minded with, with, with uh, a client communications. This chart just, just shows the relationship uh, involved in communication. So it's not just you and the client, it's also the organization, your colleagues, your team, all those things play a role. And if you look at the synchronous part, which means real life, so li in, in real time, verbal, nonverbal, we talked about, if you look at asynchronous, which is not in real time, but it's delayed, it's later, hospital sheets and clinic notes. The reason why I want to bring this up is because another form of communication is between team members. And we've all seen records from a patient or from your, your colleague at either your hospital or another one. You've picked up those records and you thought, what's the plan? What's the follow-up? What are my expectations? What should I talk about this pet owner next? It's not my case, but now this case is my problem. What do I do about that? So think about communication, not just at the moment with like a client, but it's also at the moment with your team but also later on with your team as well. They need to know what you were thinking when you were talking to that client. So it's very important when you have something like hospital sheets, your soap, your plan, if, if, the, if the pet shows ABC responses to my plan, here are the other options we talked about. The owner declined radiographs at the initial visit, so if the patient doesn't get better with this remedy, I want radiographs and I want this many views, this body system. Best spell it out for your, for your colleagues so that when, you, when, they, when they do pick up your case while you're on vacation, your day off, you don't want to be bothered, right? So try and plan ahead of time that communication preemptively. And then finally, culture. Culture is so complex and it goes beyond probably what we're going to talk about today, but it is a complex environment of the workplace. And safety is number one. And not safety in terms of physical safety, of course that's important, but I mean more psychological or emotional safety. Both your team members and your client have to be comfortable enough, trust you enough, you being the veterinarian, to be able to open up to you, to be able to ask you questions, to be able to question things you're saying. You want them to have that safe space. If you don't, it's gonna be, it's gonna be detrimental to the client's decision-making abilities, to your team in, in trying to take care of all these pets and clients. So you need to create a safe space. Client veterinarian communication and cross-disciplinary communication are important. That's simply that triangle picture we had in the previous slide, emphasizing that there are more than one person or more than two people involved in this process. And then training communication skills is, is paramount. We'll talk about it towards the end, but we have to have continuous training for, for communication skills. So this is a reminder of all the people involved with the process. It's not just simply veterinarian talking to clients. All these people are involved directly or indirectly. The same thing goes for the, for the, for the factors that are not related to people. Everything from your parking lot to your lobby, these things influence how the client perceives things. It influences how your team operates. It, it influences your process. Uh, so that last one there, process efficiency with finances, diagnostics, treatments. You don't want the process to be clunky. It shouldn't feel that way. It shouldn't feel rushed. It should feel smooth. It should feel routine. And when I say feel, not just the client, but to the team as well. All these things are important things to keep in mind. So now we're going to move on to communication effects. This is what effects communication has on the, on the uh, vet in veterinary medicine. Everybody agrees across the board, it's an indispensable skill, it's mandatory, it's required, it's part of everything you do. Not just veterinary medicine, but any occupation that involves people. Communication is vital. It impacts quality of care and it improves clinical outcomes. So it's been shown in the literature that if your communication with your clients or your patient is unclear, then it's going to affect that person's ability to be able to make a decision. It affects their ability to recall things, it affects their compliance, it affects their satisfaction, they start to doubt you, they go elsewhere for information. And we all know where elsewhere is the internet. And so you wanna make sure that your communication skills are perfectly honed. That way the client can, can recall things, remember things, be more compliant, you'll enjoy them more as a client. And it's better for the pet, that's the main factor here. You wanna make sure that, that at the end of the day, the pet's care is improved. When, you, when the client feels they have a lack of sincerity or respect and acknowledgement from the veterinarian, that's when they're dissatisfied, disillusioned, even hostile. 
So it's very, very important to have the client on your side. And the way to do that is through effective communication. What this means with client satisfaction is not dealing with the irate client who's unprofessional, being rude and abusive. That's not what we're talking about. So in this picture, for example, this doctor is just getting yelled at by this owner. He's upset because of whatever reason. We've all had these clients before. We as a profession need to decide to stop catering to clients that are simply toxic. You have the right for as a client to be upset and you should vocalize that. But there's a professional um, way that we accept in society to talk about moments when we are upset and being abusive, yelling, being hostile, being threatening are factors that all of us across the board consider inappropriate. We as veterinarians have allowed toxic clients to, to survive in this medium for way too long. We've sacrificed the health and well-being of our staff to appease these clients. And that is just wholeheartedly incorrect. Especially this day and age where most facilities are very busy. It's, it shouldn't even be a financial decision anymore. It should be one of, this person is toxic for our, for our environment. We need to let them go. You have the right to refuse service and to fire the client. They can seek help elsewhere. So keep in mind, client satisfaction is not sucking up to people. Client satisfaction is, is optimizing your communication skills and your workflow to, ha to make that client feel as though they are heard and they are happy with their decision. The other effects of communication are medical board cases, litigation. And of course, veterinarians are terrified of this. 80% of medical board cases are the result of poor communication. One communication problem was found in 32% of these cases but almost 50% had more than one communication problem. And, these, and the majority of these communication issues were between veterinarian and pet owner. But you can see 42% are actually communication problems within the team. And 50% of those problems that occurred harmed the, the patient, 10% re resulted in death. So it's very, very important that communication is practiced and perfected as much as you can to avoid situations like this. This is a graph from that paper. By the way, anything that I'm referencing here is in the proceedings as well, so you can look at all those references um, at, your, at your convenience. But this is just to show gra gra uh, in, in a graphic manner what the, uh, what the distribution was of these problems. And then, of course, you can see here that the majority is between owner and veterinarian, but then a close second place is within teams. And then between hospitals did make up some poor communication aspects to this, but it's not, it's not the majority. Everybody agrees, veterinarians, vet students, those in training, that communication skills are actually more important than clinical knowledge. That's across the board, both on the human side, so with medical doctors, and, veterinary, and the veterinary side. Um, the majority of people believe that to be the case. And I suspect probably why that is, because clinical knowledge can be memorized. You, it, became, it can become muscle memory. You can regurgitate the information. The, the, Communication skills part is not as logical. It's not as clear cut, black and white. It's much more gray. It's, it's, it's much more situational. Depends on the person and the environment and the client and the pet and all that stuff. So it's no wonder that folks consider communication skills more valuable than clinical knowledge because it is much more difficult to attain. And you can have all the clinical knowledge you want, but at the end of the day, if you can't communicate that well, that client will not have faith in what you're saying and you're going to lose that client or even worse, hurt that pet's opportunity to be cared for. So why do, why do veterinary teams struggle with communication? Now we're on to the part of the talk regarding challenges. Why, do we have the, why is communication such a challenging thing? Well, some of this stuff is in the literature, some of it is my own opinion. The first one is my opinion. I think that when you mix a, a, a health-based industry like veterinary medicine, but you mix it with service-based and, and a cash flow industry, I think that's a mixture for trouble because you're trying to not just do what's best for the pet, but you also have to provide a almost hotel level of, of comfort for that pet owner cater to them you know, from a, from a non-medical standpoint. And that's tough for veterinarians. We're not trained to do that. But unfortunately, we do have a, a hospitality type industry mixed in with medicine. And that makes things a bit messy. Insurance doesn't work the same way in the veterinary field as it does in medical. So you can't just ask for all the tests and get all the results back that you want. It doesn't work that way. You have people to, to, to convince that pet owner that 
that you want to run these diagnostics and here's why. And there's a cost associated with that and the client has to approve it. They don't need to do anything that you tell them to do. So I believe that one of the struggles here is that we're mixing what should be almost black and white medicine with something that's not so black and white, which is customer service. Then, we, then the litigation um, mitigation techniques that we use. So we are constantly practicing defensive medicine as veterinarians. We're always worried about, well, what if they report me? What if they sue me? What if they take me to court? And because of that, we end up recommending all the things and not really thinking about it in the context of what the pet owner wants or what they can afford or what they believe they should do. So we end up trying to protect ourselves, but at the end of the day, hurting, hurting those pets. And we need to, you need to not be, um, you need to not just let go of defensive medicine or concern about litigation, but you, but you ought to, you ought to figure out a way to make the pets care the priority. So litigation, mitigation, and defensive medicine are, are other factors that really affect our ability to communicate with people effectively. Then fine tuning the diagnostics in the medical plan. So we as veterinarians are so worried if we, if we can't get permission from that pet owner to run a certain diagnostic, we're not going to get the answer. And if we don't have the answer, what are we going to do? How are we going to treat this patient? What if things go wrong? What if I choose the wrong treatment because I didn't have that diagnostic at hand? We freak out about that. When really at the end of the day, the burden actually falls on the pet owner because you have to give them those options. They need to decide what to do and what not to do. So we need to, in those situations where the client is giving you a very limited way of managing that case, you need to be able to fine tune that case for that pet owner. Okay, out of these diagnostics, uh, Ms. Smith, you're telling me you can't afford these, that's fine. Then if I have to prioritize these, I want radiographs first, blood work second, I can forego the urine if I need to, and we can only, we can run our fecal if, if nothing else shows up on these diagnostics. Does that sound good? Can we work in that order? And people are fine with that. You give them the option, you're fine tuning the, the plan. If you had one test to pick for this, for this pet and the client understands pros and cons of that one diagnostic, then, then have at it. But we need to be better at fine tuning our plans. Confidence and competence go together. And veterinary students, of course, have the least amount of confidence and the least amount of competence. And then as they get more seasoned as veterinarians, they gain confidence, they gain competence. That's shown through the literature, that's standard. And so we need to work on improving your ability to be confident when you're talking to a pet owner. And then finally, there's inherent personality types. Um, this is the big five personality profile. So neuroticism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and uh, neuroticism in the veterinary field is above average. We are way more neurotic as a field uh, uh, in, on an individual basis. And unfortunately, that personality type makes us more prone to being depressed, having uh, um, emotional liabilities, we feel shame. It's, 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 not, it's, a, it's, a negative, it's a negative personality attribute and we are overrepresented in that category. So to some degree, I believe, this is partly, this is from the literature, but also partly my opinion. I think that the inherent personality types of veterinarians lends them to the challenges of being, of feeling like salespeople when in the exam room, and which is not what they signed up for. They signed up to be a doctor and take care of animals. However, you're trying to sell something to a person, it's very uncomfortable for us. And if you're looking at uh, the neuroticism, the level of neuroticism being high in the vet space, that doesn't help your ability to be a confident salesperson. So we have to combat our inherent personality types as well as veterinarians. So the, the point of this is, is, is there may be the case in the future where vet schools don't go simply based on your application, but perhaps they're going to go based on a personality profile, a personality test. And perhaps we start selecting for those individuals who are in the personalities that would, would jive more so with what's required from a veterinarian. It sounds, it sounds cold hearted because you don't have a control really over your personality type, but it's something that we may see more of in the literature. Who knows where this will go? A continuation of the challenges that we're facing. So veterinarians uh, have a lack of formal education with regard to education. We don't emphasize its importance as much as we do diagnosing and treating stuff. So that's a problem. Less than 50% of veterinarians receive communication skills training in school. 65% felt they were not prepared for communication issues after, uh, after uh, uh, vet school. 50% of graduates did, did 
uh, participate in communication training workshops. So there's clearly a deficit and there's a desire there. In fact, when you look at veterinary students, 88% feel that their communication skills need improvement. 60% feel as though they are having difficulty with effective communication. 95%, of course, this is obvious, uh, feel that training would positively influence their communication with clients and 75%, 76% desire to participate in interprofessional training. So there's a, there's a clear deficit in educating us on communication and there's a, there's a strong desire to want to get better at it. This is very interesting. When I was researching for this webinar, I found that 20% of veterinarians don't offer other treatment alternatives and 30% of vets disagree that all treatment options should be presented to owners. And I'm sure, uh, well, probably a third of you feel this way, 30%. Uh, however, this floored me because I'm going to go through my perspective on this as a board certified surgeon, 18 years in the, in the field, and I, I, uh, I hope this number goes down over time. There's an expectation by clients that veterinarians will support and validate their decisions made, even when the veterinarian disagrees and the client's actions may not seem medically appropriate or ideal. These clients seek validation and affirmation from you. They seek the, the veterinarian to understand and accept why they are doing what they're doing with their pet. And that's the, that's the underlying premise here. You're working with the client, you are, you are stuck based on what it is they are going to approve, and those clients are looking for you to validate their decision even though what you're offering them or what they elect to do is not considered gold standard level of care. Then we have the challenges that we are just different than human medicine. Animals can't speak for themselves, much like pediatrics, where you have to rely on mom and dad to, to give them the symptoms, give the doctor the symptoms of what's going on with that pet. We also have a time crunch when we're consulting. The average time is 24 minutes in the literature, and that is not enough time for a lot of veterinarians, especially those that are a bit more uh, new into the field to discuss everything from history, physical exam, recommendations, the plan, going over diagnostics, talking about that disease that you suspect the pet might have. We just don't have enough time. Then clients end up going home, they do their own quote unquote research, they're Googling stuff, they're going on social media platforms, they're asking around. Finally, a big one here, Costs not correlating to value. We as veterinarians are terrible at this. We are terrible at, at convincing the pet owner that what they paid for was worth it. There's buyer's remorse constantly in our field because the veterinarian did their job, they recommended diagnostics, they reported the results, but the client didn't feel it was worth it. And, and we need to figure out a way, again, to not seem too salesy for people, but we gotta figure out a way to also be able to have help them understand the value that they got for the dollar spent. It's, an, uh, it's, a, it's a necessary evil of the, of the profession, but this is paramount. Veterinarians have a fear of missing a diagnosis. Like we said earlier, if the client doesn't allow you to run all diagnostics, well then maybe you're gonna miss something, and so that's a challenge. Whereas on the human side, you can kind of sign up for stuff and you're gonna go with the flow. There's insurance involved with that. Continuing education is, is a struggle. You know, we all have um, at least one license and that requires a certain number of hours of continuing education. But it's not just that, it's the content of it. To try and stay up to date with all the different diseases and surgeries and species and conditions, treatment options out there is impossible. And we feel the pressure of, well, what if the current recommendations that I've been giving for people for 10 years now changes because some paper came out, some landmark study came out that now changes that. Am I going to be held accountable because I didn't know that paper existed. I didn't go to that conference. That conference didn't have that talk, whatever. It's a stressor. And then euthanasia exists, right? Unlike on the human side, we can euthanize pets. And so there's always a, uh, there's a that's always an outcome, it, you know? And, 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 and although we are used to euthanasia, we still can't forget we're killing an animal. And hopefully we're killing them because there is a quality of life issue, right? There's a real reason, there's a real problem why we're doing it, but it still weighs on you. And uh, ending a life uh, uh, by choice is not easy. And so we have that to contend with, unlike our human counterparts. 
So by now you might be feeling that this is all just in disarray, where where we have no hope. What do we do about this? Or all these problems? This stresses me out. This resonates with me as a veterinarian. I've been feeling all these ways for so many years. What do I do about it? Well, let's talk about options. Let's talk about a plan. And this is going to be hopefully more more fun part of of this talk. And a lot of this will be my perspective. And I'm, I welcome any feedback, comments, questions with it. So when you talk about spectrum of care, you want to realize that some cases are clear cut, others are not. And you have to give people options then because of that. When you give somebody options, you need to talk about the pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of each option. Option. They also have to understand what the costs are, the financial costs, and what benefit they're going to gain from those, from those different options. So if the pet owner can't, can't approve plan A and plan B, which is, your, which is the ones that you are highlighting the most, and they're going for plan C or D, they need to understand, okay, that's, that's fine. Here's what we may end up missing or where we might find ourselves a day or two from now. Here's what the outcome could be, you could expect. Um, so as long as you're okay with that, we can go with plan C or plan D. And they have, so they have to understand what the next steps are in the context of if we succeed, what's the next step? If we fail, what's the next step? And if they failed, if the case failed, whatever that means for that case, then we go back to, well, maybe we should consider plan A and plan B. We tried plan C and D, it didn't work out. Can we revisit those other options that I gave you two days ago? Document everything. All of your communication, I don't care how a minuscule, minuscule you think or how obvious you think a, trans, a communicative transaction was in an exam room, you need to document it. If you think the patient, the client is coming in under the influence of drugs or alcohol, they're slurring their words, you need to put that in there. You need to put in your impressions of what's going on in the exam room in your medical records. This is how you protect yourself. When you talk about a client approving the less than ideal plan that wasn't your first recommendation, but those options are viable options, put that in your medical record. Reviewed A, B, and C, client declined for financial reasons. We plan on this uh, 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 course of action to take. Client understands the inherent risks, which include blah, 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 blah. All that ought to be in your communication. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, I don't have time for that. I'm already crunched with 24 minutes in the exam room, plus, plus follow-up after that. When am I gonna have time to write my notes? Yeah, that's a procedural problem that needs to be figured out because the option of not documenting anything is not an option. You have to do it. So figure out a way to make it where it can fit in your work day um, without messing up the whole process that you're trying to do with getting people out on time, getting pets taken care of, getting discharges done, billing done, etc. Document everything. Figure out a way to fit it in, document everything, and document it in as close to real time as possible so you don't forget stuff. This, this, the trends of writing records later doesn't work. You're gonna forget details. And some of those details, mention that the client was hostile, mention that they, were, that they slurred their words, um, they weren't paying attention, they, kept, they were on their phone, their, their, their baby was crying constantly in the exam room and it was causing a distraction. Put those things in your record. You have to paint the picture. If anything goes to a medical board case, you want to have them be able to not question anything that occurred. The medical record is it. That's what they have to go by. It doesn't matter what you say after the fact. So this slide is, to, is to, for me to go over some examples with you. And these are cases that I've dealt with, I'm sure a lot of you have, but I wanna show kind of the, the spectrum of care aspect of this. So let's say you've got a dachshund and the dog is non-ambulatory in the pelvic limbs, you're diagnosing a T3L3 myelopathy, probably a disc herniation, the ideal plan, this dog is, has no motor, questionable nociception in those hind legs, so questionable deep pain, it needs immediate, neurosurgery evaluation, diagnostics like a myelogram, CT, or an MRI, and then followed by probably spinal surgery because it's a dachshund. And that's going to be, depending on where you live, let's say you're in LA, $10,000. And that pet owner is like, you're out of your mind. I'm not doing that. What's another option? And I'm not euthanizing this dog. So now you have to go through options. Okay, well, if we can't do that, can I at least collect radiographs? To, maybe I can find something, maybe I can't. Discs don't really show up that well on radiographs unless they're calcified. Can I do that? Understanding that it may not give us the answer, but if it does help me, I can help fine tune our treatment plan. Can I at least do x-rays? No, you can't. We need something else. Okay, well, if we're not going to run diagnostics, how about some treatment options then? Because ideally, this dog needs emergency spine surgery. If you're not willing to do that and you understand that the prognosis to walk again with that type of neurologic presentation is less than 50% with only medications and time, 
do you want me to offer you some medication options? Yes, please. I need to do that. There's no way I can afford this. I need to talk to my husband. I got to talk to the kids. I need something to make this pet feel better until we can make a decision. You got it. Acupuncture, physical therapy, supplements, pain meds, anti-inflammatories, right? Uh, physical therapy exercises at home or in a, in a physiotherapy center, whatever it may be. All those are options. And the client may not even be able to afford or, or consent to all those treatment options. Maybe all they're looking for is some prednisone and some, some, some YouTube videos to show them how to do physical therapy at home. And you know that's not the ideal for this dog, but it's not like those other options you're giving them are not valid and they're certainly not unethical. Those are options and who knows what the response will be. We know the stats on this is, are clear, but less than 50% chance to walk again is not 0%. And that's what these pet owners need. They need to know the spectrum. Let's say you've got the blocked cat down there. So male cat, urinary obstruction, urethral obstruction, and the, it's the second time this cat's had it. You're now talking about a perineal urethrostomy surgery. They can't afford it. You go over the pros and cons. The, the idea of surgery scares them. The complication scares them. The costs are somewhat of a concern, but they're like, I don't want to put my male cat through it. He's only four years old. Is there anything else we can do? Well, there was a paper out a few years ago that talked about, I think it was what, around 70% success rate with having blocked cats in a room alone, lights shut off, blanket over their cage, maintain a stress-free environment, and some of those cats, the majority, uh, will unblock themselves. Just from, from virtue of the fact of giving them fluids, medications, and then letting the environment come down uh, um, uh, in terms of stress levels. We, you know, we know that these cats have urinary obstruction, feline lower urinary tract disease because of, we think, because of a, a, of, of a hyperactive nervous system where their sympathetics are just raising, they get interstitial cystitis, et cetera. And so when a paper like that comes out, that should now, that shouldn't tell you that's the ideal. That should tell you in a situation where this pet owner is not willing to consent to hospitalization, blood work, radiographs, ultrasound, possibly surgery, unblocking, urinary catheter. If they're not gonna to consent to that, well, what else can I offer them? I'm, I, I'm, I, it's heartbreaking to euthanize these young male cats because people can't afford all the things or they don't wanna do all the things. So that's an example of, of research that comes out that you can then apply to your cases, especially those where you're not allowed by the pet owner to perform the ideal, but you wanna do something for this pet. You've got them in the bottom right, an older dog. He's got gnarly teeth and he's, he's being dropped off today for a dental. He's had no prior medical history other than being geriatric. And the plan was to run blood work that day, followed by a dental procedure under full anesthesia, have them discharged at night. You have permission to extract the teeth, put on my antibiotics and pain meds if you need to, whatever the situation calls for. You're gonna collect radiographs at the same time while they're under anesthesia. Routine dentistry, right? Well, you run the blood work, the chemistry and the CBC, and you find out you have elevated liver values, which has never been recorded in this dog's history. Now, the liver values are mildly elevated, but they are elevated. What do you do? My suggestion, A, full transparency with the pet owners, call them up, tell them what you're finding, B, give them options. And you might think, well, I see lots of old dogs that are aclinical, that have elevated liver values, not that high. Why wouldn't you just go right to anesthesia? That's a decision for the owner to make, but you as a doctor are required to update them on what's going on. If the blood work was normal, you could have just proceeded with the dentistry. It's not normal. There are high liver values. How high they are, it's mild, but they're elevated. And so on paper, you have an abnormality. And so you ought to be able to convey that to the pet owner and give them the options. Now you might be thinking as a veterinarian, yeah, but this dog is old. They're not going to clean the teeth then. And those teeth are disgusting and I, I can smell them. I'm sure at least, at least two teeth are super loose. And, and what, if, uh, what about bacterial seeding in the bloodstream, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to scare this pet owner because liver values are high and they're not going to want to do the procedure. That's up to them. That is not your call to make. So what you do, in my opinion, in this situation, I've done this many, many times, call the pet owner, tell them, liver values were elevated. What does that mean? It can mean nothing, it can mean everything. I've had dogs that were scanned by abdominal ultrasound um, for, for this situation, liver is completely normal. And I've had other ones that have had liver cancer and everything in between. I don't know, but the elevations are there. They're mild, but we also know that the magnitude of elevation may not correlate to severity of liver disease. Well, he's not showing any symptoms at home. He's, 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 not, he's not sick. 
So we don't know when these liver values start to elevate and dogs compensate very well for their clinical signs. Or maybe he's not feeling any symptoms from the liver, liver enzymes being elevated because there's no disease there. We don't know the answer. This might be liver values that are coming down. Maybe they were elevated a month ago and no one knew because the dog wasn't due for their annual and now they're coming down. Or there's the beginning of something and it's gonna go up. We don't know. Well, what's the next steps? What can I do? Here are your options, abdominal ultrasound, or if you don't want to do that, then we can recheck liver values in three or four weeks because the half-life of these liver enzymes are about three to four weeks. So in, in theory, if the liver values are improving by 50% every month, that's a good sign that whatever this was is transient. We go to put them on liver medications or supplements, things like that. I can refer you to the internal medicine specialist if you want to go that route. Um, you can cancel the procedure and not do anything I say, or you can ignore all my all of my recommendations and go forward with the procedure understanding that most anesthetics go through the liver and it could cause a, an issue during or after anesthesia, an issue being anything from just slow recovery all the way to death, but the choice is yours. We have done dentistries on patients in this situation and they've done fine, but I can't promise you anything. What do you want to do? And then the top right, you've got a young German Shepherd, a foreign body. It's clear on the radiographs. There's a huge rock in the middle of the, of the, of the small intestines. It needs an emergency abdominal exploratory, and they are declining. That's a situation that's a bit more clear cut. Those other cases we spoke about, there are some options there, and you can go through pros and cons. This dog requires surgery. There is no amount of, of, of gastroprotectants, of motility drugs, of analgesia that's going to make that dog pass that rock. It is obstructed. It's been obstructed for three days. He's sick. He's hypovolemic. He needs immediate surgery and stabilization. And the clients say no. What are some other options? There are no other options other than euthanasia. Or you can relinquish the pet and maybe then you can fix the, the dog yourself, adopt him out, whatever it is. But the point is that pet owner has no other option. It's either surgery relinquish or euthanasia. There is no medical plan for this dog. It's impossible and it's unethical. So that's a situation where there's not a lot of leeway there. They need to do what's appropriate. And so just some case examples for you guys. Um, uh, hopefully that kind of gave you some, some pearls. So spectrum of care is essential to practice. It's required, it's mandatory, it's standard. It's not going anywhere. You gotta offer a spectrum of options. There are always gonna be changes in the trends, both from industry standards, so new research comes out. And there's always fluctuations in community expectations. The society itself dictates what, what's kind of trendy right now in the animal health space as well. And so those things need to be kept to keep in mind. We're all familiar with barriers, socioeconomic, geographic, health literacy, all these things play a role in a uh, spectrum of care. And so it makes it uh, challenging, but also I think invigorating because you're giving people an option. They don't always have to do the, the, the best. Um, except for that German Shepherd, for example, where it's pretty clear cut. A lot of cases you can actually get away with, okay, well that client is not going to consent to what I want. What else can I offer them? Care is tailored to the patient along a continuum of acceptable options. Every word in that sentence matters. That's how you do this. It's not done recklessly or unethically or illegally. This is, it's a, it's a continuum of acceptable options. Four skills are cited in the literature that may be required to try and maximize your ability for spectrum of care. Open-ended inquiry. Ask open-ended questions. There is a difference between saying, there's no vomiting, right? Versus, have you seen any vomiting? Same question, ask two different ways. The open-ended question, have you seen any vomiting? Let's the pet owner decide, think about it, unbiased. Have I seen vomiting today? I think, my, I think my wife said yesterday she saw some vomiting versus there's no vomiting, right? Uh, no, 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 no vomiting. You've, you've persuaded that client. It's, it's, it may be subtle, but you, but you already kind of told them there's no vomiting, right? There's, a, there's pressure there. So you want open-ended inquiry. So other examples for spectrum of care include, so what are your thoughts, Ms. Smith? How do you guys feel about that? What do you think? Floor is yours. Open-ended. Instead of, so do you want to do it? Is that okay with you? Is that plan fine? Close ended. Doesn't have room for conversation then. Reflective listening. Listen, actually listen to them and think about what they're saying. Putting aside your preconceived notions and your perspectives, put it aside. Listen to them. What They may teach you something or they may actually trigger something in your brain that says, oh, you know what? Actually, I just thought of a new option based on that question they just asked me. Transparency. Be transparent. We as veterinarians are known for this. We're ethical creatures. 
Be transparent with, with people. It's okay to tell them how it is. Not every news is good news. That's okay. That's part of the game. Unconditional positive regard. This goes back to the clients that are expecting you to validate, to support, to be okay with their decision, even though they know that, that the decision they're making is not your ideal plan, doctor, but they still expect you to support them. And we should. We should support them. We want to do what's best for the pet. So be, be careful to instill as little as possible your own personal ethics, beliefs, cultures, etc. Remember, your primary goal is to take care of pets. That's the goal here. However we have to get to that goal, I don't care, but get to that goal. That's what we're trying to do. And pet owners share the same goal. Just because a pet owner is declining doing a procedure or a diagnostic doesn't mean they're bad people that are wishing harm on their animals. They just are realistic. They know their life. And they can't sacrifice other things in their life to, to dedicate themselves to this, this diagnostic or procedure. So they need other options. So you share the same goal with people. Life is complex and messy, it's filled with give and take. And that's where spectrum of care falls. There's a great quote from one of the references I have in the proceedings. Perspective taking and seeking also require us to draw upon cultural humility and recognize that our clients view their patients' care journeys through a unique lens that may be influenced by personal, familial, cultural, and societal perspectives on the relationships with animals, the function and inherent value of the individual patient, as well as the uniqueness of their bond. Wonderfully said. That's exactly what we're trying to push for here. I'm going to go through some more examples now. These are all pictures of different ways that convey communication. And of course, this is going to be nonverbal, right? They're only pictures. You, those of you who are watching this, may feel immediately an emotion when you see something like this. So for example, you have the veterinarian who has a, who has a spot to sit, decides not to. He's going to kneel down across the wall, be at the level of the pet. Show the pet owner that I'm here with your dog. And the, the, the gentleman, the older gentleman, the dog owner is speaking, the veterinarian is listening, but focusing on their pet. That's gonna make the, the pet feel good, but make the pet owner feel like, wow, this, this guy really, is, really cares about my dog. And he's at the same level as the pet. He's showing, he's showing that we're at the same level, I'm not above you because I'm a doctor or a human. I'm right there with you. It's a, that's, that's great, and we do this all the time. Also notice, no lab coat with the doctor. Now. I can see both perspectives with that. You want to maintain a level of professionalism in the exam room, and maybe scrubs aren't the best. Scrubs also are worn by, in some places, receptionists, technicians, assistants. So it may not be the best, or maybe it is. Maybe the white coat syndrome is a factor here. Maybe you don't want the client to feel like you're, you are superior to them with that white coat. That you have, you have the stethoscope on, you've got your scrubs on, you're, you presented yourself as a doctor, you're, you're saying and doing doctor things in the exam room. Do you really need that coat or is that coat giving an impression of superiority? Think of these things. I don't know the answer, I'm just pointing it out. This is another a great picture. So the doctor and the pet owner are at the same level, right? She's not talking down to him. They are at the same level. And she's going over diagnostics. Now, ignoring the fact that nobody would read x-rays this way, you need a film viewer, uh, you know, it's staged photo, obviously. But the point is, when you perform diagnostics for your client, for that pet, and it's diagnostics you can show them, which almost everything can be shown, then show it to them. It, it's gonna take more time, yes, but I promise you, they're going to see way more value in what they, what they spent and they are going to appreciate what you're saying. They'll be convinced that you're smart and you know what you're talking about as a doctor and they can make a better decision for the pet and it usually works towards better compliance, better outcome for that, that case. Show them the blood work with the red values being elevated. Show them the x-ray. Show them the CAT scan on the computer or the MRI on the computer. They don't need to learn how to read an MRI. They just need to see what you're seeing. Show them and they will, they will be much more strongly believing in what you're saying and what they need to do for their pet when you show them diagnostics. Here's another great example of being at the same level with the pet owner, both are sitting. So when, you, when a doctor is standing and pacing and, and what have you, you have, you have appointments waiting, they're knocking down your next surgery, you haven't eaten yet today, that, that demeanor is going to affect the pet owner. If you're sitting down, it shows a, a, a level of, I'm here for you. I'm giving you attention. Here's what I think is going on with Fluffy. And you can sit down and you can, you can both be in a more comfortable state. Sure, in the back of your mind, you're thinking of all the responsibilities you have today, but for right now, in that moment, 
you need to be present. And this type of, of posturing is really good for that. Here's even better. Less interview style, more casual, side by side. Doctor next to client, talking about the pet, side by side. It's even less formal than the previous picture because it's not an interview style, it's a conversation. We're both in this together. Me and the pet owner, me as the doctor and the pet owner are both on the same team to take care of the dog. It's great. Here's another level, I, I love this. The doctor not just makes sure that he's at the level of the client, he's actually below eye level. He's showing, he's showing submission, he's showing, hey, I'm, I'm here for you. What do you need? Here are the options, right? Great, kneeling down in front of the pet owner. He's relaxed, she's relaxed, they're talking about stuff. It's great. Here is another one. Same sort of idea here, side by side, sitting down, relaxed, and showing diagnostics. And this is the best for me. This I think is, is the primo. You have a doctor kneeling, not across from the person, not, not like in this picture where they're across from each other, they're adjacent to each other. So you have that same sort of casual conversation type demeanor. The doctor is kneeling down, she's at a lower level than the, than the pet owner and she's showing them diagnostics or an estimate or something, the discharge instructions, whatever. Relaxed, present, this is, this is great, this is great. And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll switch between all these different positions. Remember, this is all nonverbal. I will switch between these different positions depending on what the case entails. So for example, I'll use this one especially when I'm gonna show the pet owner, look, here's what it costs for emergency spine surgery at this facility. And so I'll go through line by line. I'll be right next to them. So they, they don't feel that I'm talking at them, that I'm demanding, that I'm being pushy. I'm there side by side. Here's, here's the deal. This is what it costs to provide this level of care at this hospital. Da, 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 da. Go through it. What questions do you have? And you go, you go from there. So finally, veterinarians, we are known for having difficult conversations. It's important to ask open-ended questions. It's important to really perfect your nonverbal communication skills. You want to be able to relate to people. You want to have them be able to feel comfortable with you so they can open up and tell you honestly what they think. You want to develop a relationship with them that is professional, right, of course, but also it bridges the gap of personal. You, you want to have empathy for them. So if the pet owner is really struggling because they can't afford um, something and the only other option is going to be euthanasia, give an example of how in your life you were saddened when you were a child because of, of something that happened with your pet or a client you had last month or last year that you still remember because it resonated with you because a, a sad decision had to be made. Relate to them. Share those experiences with them. You want to respect the autonomy of the clients, making them feel like they have full control what you're doing as a veterinarian, you're arming them with the knowledge that they don't have. The pros and cons, the diagnostics, what your differentials are, what the plan is, complications, side effects, whatever. You're arming them with the knowledge, but they have to decide what they want to do. So you're giving them autonomy. You don't want to make them feel guilty just because they are not doing your, your ideal plan. So all of this falls underneath practice. Practice, practice, practice. Emotional intelligence, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship management. These are very complex topics. We can't fix them on today's, on today's talk, but you wanna keep things in mind so you can continue to improve throughout your career. The last few bullet points there are all methods that are published in the literature to try and improve our ability to communicate with pet owners. You can use real life cases, you can do lecture based, role playing, all the stuff viable. We're going to see more and more schools who will hopefully um, incorporate communication lessons, teachings, webinars, lectures, whatever, in their curriculum. It's vital, it's vital. And we need it now more than ever considering the veterinary crisis we're in. So we'll keep these things in mind of areas of, of improvement and what options there are to continue educating and improving. And this is a nice uh, picture showing the relationship. You know, you have the, the pink bubble there, veterinarian specific factors. You've got client specific factors there in the green, yellow, you've got patient, and each one of them has their own viewpoints, their own perspectives, and they're going to overlap, obviously. And then at the, at the very center there, at, at the end of the day, it's quality of life. And we are all essentially pursuing that. Just because a pet owner can't afford or is unwilling to consent to the ideal plan, don't forget as a veterinarian, our focus is quality of life. And that quality of life is shared with, between all three of these circles. 
despite all of our own sort of plans, we have to come together to an agreement of what to do for this, for this pet. And that's what inherently being a veterinarian is all about. So I wanna thank everybody for attending, watching, listening this talk on communication and client relationships. I hope you found it useful. Here is a QR code to Vet Triage if you're interested in about learning more about that. And then all my contact information there, feel free to reach out to me with any questions, concerns, comments at any time. And I can now entertain any questions that you might have. A great presentation, Shadi. Thank you. My pleasure. Are there any questions? Hey, Shadi, it's Bonnie. Bonnie. Um, How's it going? Good. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like in my sweats and everything, but let, I, we all know each other, so I think yeah. we're good. So I loved this. Um, so in my new role at UA, I'm a clinical year mentor to the clinical year students. And one of my big jobs is reviewing their medical records mm -hmm. and giving them feedback. And um, things are getting better, but one of the one of the trends that I was seeing was that I was getting medical records that were really light. I mean, light on everything, light on documentation of what happened in the, mm -hmm. you know, medically light on documentation about what, you know, the, the communication light on documenting what the follow-up plan was so that we could have continuity of care. Mm -hmm. Um, and so as I started pushing back with my students that, you know, we need more documentation so that we understand what's happening, you know, with this case, um, I started getting the impression that a lot of what students are taught about medical record keeping is that it's important to do because you might get sued. Mm -hmm. So you want to protect yourself. So when you were talking about like that defensive medicine, I was like, this is baked into what we're teaching students about how to keep records. I mean, that's like the, they're leading with mm -hmm. keep good records so you don't get sued, mm -hmm. right? Rather than keep good records so that we know like what's going on with the patient, right? That we can have excellent continuity of care. If you're out one day and somebody picks your case up or they go to another clinic, like we know exactly what your thought process was, what needs to happen next, what you discussed, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so- I feel like, like so much of this, I mean, the reason I'm in education is because I feel like, you know, everyone goes through vet school or vet tech school and we can, we can like kind of filter these problems like at that point. Right. Yes. Uh, but I think, you know, I think there's so many ways that communication can, can, I don't think I have a question. I think I'm just rambling, but I think there's so many ways that communication can be built into our educational systems. Right. So it's like, I, I just loved that triangle you had of like, it's not just client communication, it's communication in the team. And it's not just about, I think so much of communication in the team. Again, the lead there is like, Oh, we want to be professional and not have a toxic environment, which is absolutely important. But, but we also need to learn how to communicate about the patient and make sure that everyone is on the same page about what we are doing with our patients and how we are treating clients and how we, you know, speak to clients. You know what I mean? Like, yes. it's just like, so, I feel like there's it, like what we talk about for the most part is really superficial. Mm -hmm. So I just loved this talk because I feel like it hit a lot of things that we don't really address much and we can get at in creative ways and other ways and kind of build into like a holistic practice. Well, I'll, 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 I'll add on to what you just said. That's fantastic points. So, um, if you saw on the, the personality profile, neuroticism, we're above yeah. average. And right off the bat, a, 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 that negative emotion, it gets sucked into other negative emotions. Fear, right? So fear of being sued is one. Yeah. And the problem is if we're leading with that right off the gates, because that's the personality type, that, that, that person came with that. If we're leading in with that type of personality, well, you're already set up for a disaster, and if you're being if you're being thrown into the world of mitigation and all the litigation, I'd rather um, you're you're going to focus on that instead of what you're referring to. Which why don't we focusing on the positive aspect of this? I'm right. not writing a record as a court defense. I'm writing it as a medical record. 
which is going to be clear right. communication and documentation of what occurred. It, 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 the lens should be different. There's a difference between telling a pet owner, we, we close at 8 versus we are open until 8. Open until 8, much more welcoming and inviting. We are open until yeah. 8. We close at 8. We close at 8. Meaning, don't even try to show up at 8.01. We are closed. You know, yeah. and so there's a difference there. Same question being, or, or same statement being being made, but you are one is coming at the perspective of a positive uh, 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 reinforcement. The other is more negative, and yeah. I think that it's it's a huge detriment to vet students, especially to push to push this this fear because that's exactly what's happening. Then they're writing records from the lens point of protecting themselves. If you write a good record that shows what occurred, what was spoken about, that's inherently your defense. That's it. It will just by default be that way. But to go through that lens is going to be toxic. Yeah. And I think, too, even in, you know, before we get to clinics in education, coming at things from this negative viewpoint puts them in this fear mindset, which has been shown to decrease your ability to learn new things. You know what I mean? And so if we... If we're fear-based in education, we're doing a disservice because we're not allowing them to learn the things that they need to be learning, you know? This is the same situation with pet owners. They don't feel comfortable, safe with you. They can open up. They shut down. If they shut yeah. down. They're not listening to you. They're not retaining anything. They're not going to comply with your with your directions. They're going to seek help elsewhere. That's more inviting. And, and yeah. so it's the same thing with vet students. They should be hungry for knowledge. Sponges ready to soak up the world, but if you throw all this fear-based stuff, they shut down. They don't learn. Anytime in my life I've ever had a mentor that was just toxic and they're trying to teach me something, I can't hear anything they're saying because I'm because yeah. I don't want to deal with this person, right? You have a positive mentor, you just absorb everything. And that's that's human nature. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, I love this. This is great. Thank you. I would love, I would love if if you've got a copy of this, I can look at because I'd love to just kind of look back at some of your Definitely. points. Definitely, I'd be happy to share it. Any other questions, comments, concerns? No, thank you, Shadi, for for sharing. I just, yeah, another just similar to Bonnie, just another comment on kind of the importance of doing it in in a framework that people are able to to comprehend it and i think um bonnie what what i remember from like from being in school is as as we talk about yeah like you need it for this and for that like you don't just need it for the record you need it for the client right like the whole purpose is for the client when you do discharges for example to be able to understand what we're trying to explain to them because we go into that room and we like over and over and over we just throw so much information at them and you see people trying to like scramble and trying to like type things on their phone. And when I'm able to say, Hey, don't worry, like I'll send you this. It'll go to your email. You can see the stress just kind of go away from their body. Right. And they're at that moment, they're like, Oh, I can just listen. Right. So just being able to communicate and say, I'm going to send you a communication that will Mm -hmm. have all of these things that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've actually talked to some of my teams that won't like, cause I do relief. So I work with all these different teams. Right. And so some of them know where my discharges are. They know what I'm going to put in. They use them for other patients when like another doctor may not put a discharge in. So that's the other thing, like the continuity of, you know, that information is getting out there. Your team understands the importance of it. They encourage you, they help you and just being able to, to all be on the same page about the care of the animal is really ultimately what matters, right? So we've all had those yeah. those consults where the the you know the, the husband is there, you do the whole consult with him about TPLO surgery, and then the wife calls two days later, pissed off because he can't remember anything. He's not conveying the information appropriately. She wants the whole consult to get over the phone. What'd you guys talk about? He's saying some weird stuff. And if you have that documented in the record, it'll actually help you do that repeat consult on the phone much quicker. You say, okay, well, he and I spoke about A, B, and C diagnostics before the surgery. We talked about the surgery details, talked about post-operative recovery. It's all documented there. You don't have to remember what you guys spoke about. There may have been something quirky about that case that you will not remember three days later. You've seen 100 patients by then. Um, but if it's documented, you'll be able to to really, you'll be able to, to collect that, or rather, uh, reference that information and and uh, be able to speak more intelligently on it. That's yeah, kind of I, why I love, I don't know if you guys have any opinions on like the different 
discharges and links from like veterinary partners. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I find that it's so easy to like print one of those out, hand it out when you don't have the time to like come up with all of these things on the spot. So I don't know if you guys have opinions I, on- how I share, I'm a huge proponent of having people learn about stuff later on. So for example, um, I have a video on my YouTube channel about allergies and just how to think about allergies in, in dogs, right? And if I have a client that I'm speaking to, and especially if I'm pressed for time or the client just needs more understanding, I'll say, it might be allergies. I'm gonna send you a video so you learn about it more. You can talk to your friends and your family about it when you watch the video as well. That's got all the details. I wanna focus though on what tests we can do today. And then, yeah. and then they sort of say, oh, okay, I'll learn about it later. He's not very worried about this in terms of an emergency, medical emergency. Yes, tell me what to do next. And I'm a huge fan of that. Um, I think sharing information from to the client, it'll cut down your consultation time. It lets the client watch, rewatch, and re rewatch, share with people so they all can get questions together or more yeah. understanding. And then they can make a decision that's, that's more a, a based on education um, rather than feeling the pressure at the moment to make that kind of a decision. But I'm a huge fan of that kind of stuff. Yeah, share it with them. I have tons of YouTube yeah, videos I, I give it. people. I love it too because they're gonna they're gonna look stuff up, yep. you know, whether we give them something or not. So if we can at least start with good mm -hmm. resources that we've vetted, um, mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. Yeah. And I love and I love the videos because you know I mean this is the thing that we kind of um, in education right now we're kind of arguing about is making little short videos that are easy to consume, you know, well, oh, we should have students reading book chapters. Well, I mean, do we want them to learn something or do we want them to read a book chapter? You know what I mean? It's like, give them something that they're, that's going to be digestible yeah. for them. P you know? P I mean, we, people have changed. Uh, smartphones yeah. changed everything. And now to sit down and have, expect someone to read a paragraph or a page, let alone a whole chapter or a book, it's, it's like unheard of. But they want a YouTube yeah. video that's three hours long about, and they'll watch that, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's yeah, you, you have to change. You've got to, you've got to evolve with the changing times. I'm, I'm a bit more old school. I think you should read a damn book and look at all the things because that's where the details yeah. are. But it's just not that way anymore. So, right. especially yeah. pet owners. I've given up. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But that's fine. Because I'll, can... read, I'll read the book. You watch the video. <laughs> sure. But as long as we have good quality yeah. stuff, like you said, things that material that we've vetted, uh, nothing wrong with that. Um, um, Cause certainly, yeah. you know, you can argue videos are better or worse or the same as a book in terms of, of getting actual information out of them. But if the videos are good, good quality, the material is true, you know, it's factual, it can be referenced. That's, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. I think the other thing that um, we lost, we lost Alyssa and I think Amy hopped off too, but, um, but I love this, like, building in, like, utilizing technicians mm -hmm. to do a lot of this, right? Mm -hmm. Like, technicians can get your notes started, you know, and get that template going. Technician, you can, you know, you can train a technician to have a very complicated conversation with a client about, you know, diabetic management or, you know what I mean? Like chronic disease management. If, if you think about human medicine, most of the people doing that chronic disease management are, you know, nurse practitioners or PAs that have a specialty in, you know, in those things. And so I love the idea of like tr teaching vets to use technicians to do a lot of this stuff. And I think, again, it comes back to being fear-based mm -hmm. We feel like we have to have ultimate control and make sure everything's done correctly so we don't get sued, right? Yep. <laughs> you know, but yep. but but get that you know approach it from a different perspective and use the whole team to practice good medicine. In the, right? next, in the next five years, you're going to see the the roles and definitions of what a technician is evolve, and it's and it's, yeah. it's going to be to what you're what you're alluding to. They're going to become more and more like our. Uh, like uh, human counterparts with physician's assistants. They're gonna become more of that role. Um, yeah. There's a need for it, there's a desire for it. And so you gotta pay them too for that, right? More responsibility, they should right. get more compensated for it. So, but I think over the next five years, you'll start seeing technicians state by state being revisited as far as what their defining roles are. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, awesome. Shadi. Thank it's you great so to see much, you. Shadi. Good to see you too. Thanks, yeah, guys. Well